But there are a couple of issues I thought I'd just like to um, raise. One a very a seemingly minor one, uh, and the other more major, from uh, where we were last time. And this uh, refers to something um, that goes on around page 816 to 817, where Marx talks about the way in which a class comes together and starts to define itself. Uh, and, and right throughout Marx's thinking, you find him doing this frequently, which is to say, you know, you can see elements of, uh, say, class around, but it's only when uh, the situation, and he uses this word, hardens, uh, so that we can start to talk explicitly about the circulation of capital uh, and the uh, practices of a capitalist class. We can start to talk about the circulation of labour capacity. We can start to talk about the circulation of fixed capital and all the rest of it. So uh, it, it's this hardening which comes out of a, a divergent, fluid kind of pr process, but then the hardening itself becomes more fluid, but at a different scale uh, and with a different meaning. And so what he says on page 817 is he's talking a little bit about the... The, 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 the class distinctions uh, and uh, says, well, you get to the point where you, you want to examine uh, the class formation and the class formations separated from each other and as if they're hard and fast. Um, and, but then he says something interesting, uh, that in order to establish the laws of profit, insofar as they are determined by the rise and fall of wages or by the influence of landed property, then these fixed suppositions themselves become fluid in the further course of development. But, he says, only by holding them fast at the beginning is their development possible without confounding everything. And I think it's an interesting kind of way of looking at things um, but when you're looking at something, it's a very dynamic process. And so something is crystallizing out and then it's starting to actually uh, grow and morph into something which is more powerful, more, def more, or more defined, that this process is something which, uh, you know, it's, it's fluent and it's fluid and it's moving. But in order to analyze it, but even for it to actually constitute itself, it has to harden into a clear concept, if we're looking at it from the standpoint of analysis, or a clear set of institutions and relations and practices, if you're looking at it from the standpoint of the actually what's going on on the ground. And I always think this is kind of a, a useful kind of commentary, uh, and I find it useful always in my own work to sort of think about, well, okay, I want to look at the fluid dynamics of everything, but in order to do that, you need some hard and fast principles to really understand exactly uh, what is going on. Now, that's the, that's the minor point. The major point, however, is up around page uh, 851, 52, where um, Marx has dealt with this hardening uh, of uh, fixed capital formation and says at a certain point, that fixed capital formation cannot proceed uh, very fluidly and very well without calling upon the circulation of interest-bearing capital and the credit system uh, to somehow facilitate uh, the long-term investment, uh, which may take many, many years to return. So he, the credit system becomes absolutely crucial and critical for this uh, uh, this, this to occur. And so he says on, on page 851, in the case, in regard to interest, two things are to be examined. Firstly, the division of profit into interest and profit. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the division of surplus value 
into uh, the, the profit of enterprise and uh, the interest on the money capital. So instead of just looking at surplus value full stop, you look at surplus value as actually uh, being constituted by these two components. And so now we, I've talked about this before, you get a unified component in Marx. Uh, he then immediately divides it and says, okay, there are two aspects to this. So the two aspects are profit, uh, uh, industrial uh, enterprise, and um, then uh, the interest on money capital. And the way you should think of this is, uh, is as follows. That after a capitalist had been involved in the production of something, at the end of a sequence, they will end up with a certain amount of money. And they have a choice, an existential choice. What are they going to do with the money which they have accumulated from their production process? One of the things to do is to invest in uh, for, uh, the expansion of production. And so they reinvest in their activity. Uh, uh, but the other thing is they could take the money and just lend it to somebody else. They could actually turn it into, into uh, loan capital. Uh, and if conditions in their own line of production are very constrained because there's a surfeit of production, then a, a, a capitalist might say, well, I'll just take the money and go, and go elsewhere. So this idea that, that even within the enterprise, there are, there's a double aspect of whether... We, we continue with production and seek more profit through production or whether we seek to get uh, uh, interest on, on, on the money capital by lending it out to somebody. So he says this, that this difference, he says, becomes perceptible, tangible, as soon as a class of moneyed capitalists comes to confront a class of industrial capitalists. Very important line here because up until now, we're dealing with a two-class system. Uh, frequently, there is some kind of idea that there's a land, uh, landed class, uh, and, and in capital, he talks about a landed class. But here, for the first time, he's actually talking about a class of moneyed capitalists. But this is, again, a, cla a classical thing, uh, that on the one hand, uh, everybody who has money can use it to lend to somebody else, so... It hasn't hardened into a class formation, but he's saying that all of these practices at some point are likely to harden into a class formation. And that class formation becomes uh, very important in its own right. Uh, and here uh, uh, he kind of notes that capital as such uh, enters into circulation, and that is money capital enters into circulation, and this is where we start to talk about the circulation of interest-bearing capital, but this in turn entails class formation. And, uh, and this is how he puts it on, on 852. Historically, the form of industrial profit arises only after capital no longer appears alongside the independent worker. Profit thus appears originally determined by interest. But in the bourgeois economy, interest determined by profit, with only one of the latter's parts. Hence, profit must be large enough to allow of a part of it branching off as interest. Historically, the inverse. Interest must have become so depressed that a part of the surplus gain could achieve independence as profit. There is a natural relation between wages and profit. And he talks about this. Um, and, and then says, of course, it's competition between the two classes arranged under these different forms of revenues, that is, wages and, and, and profit. But in order that this competition exist, the existence of the two classes, the division of the surplus value into profits and interest, is already presupposed. To examine capital in general is not a mere abstraction. If I regard the total capital of e.g. a nation as distinct from total wage labor or as distinct from landed property, or if I regard capital as a general economic basis of a class as distinct from another class, then I regard it in general, just as I regard man e.g. as physiologically distinct from the animals. The real difference between profit and interest 
exists as the difference between a moneyed class of capitalists and an industrial class of capitalists. But in order that the two such classes may come to confront one another, the double existence presupposes a divergence within the surplus value posited by capital, a divergence which says you can separate interest on the money and profit on the industrial enterprise. So here he's kind of being very uh, explicit about class formation. He subsequently goes on to talk about the role of the merchants, but it's interesting he doesn't talk about the merchants as a class. He talks about them as providing a service uh, of uh, buying and selling for, for, for the capitalists and a specific relationship with the capitalists in which they uh, actually gain part of the surplus value. The, 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 the capitalist, in a sense, passes the commodity over to them at a discount uh, in order that they take up the kind of the, uh, the practices and the, and, and the problems of, uh, of the buying and selling in, in, in the market. But that does not, in Marx's view, constitute a class. But here he's talking about a class of moneyed capitalists and that the class of moneyed capitalists uh, starts to act, uh, as he will later on kind of point out, uh, not necessarily in, in the interest of the whole circulation of, ca of capital, but in their own interest. That is, as soon as they become a class, they will start to actually further the interests of their own class and, in, and, and, and therefore we start to get the emergence of financialization very early on. And this is what Marx is beginning to talk about really back in 1858. And this was a time when the bankers, uh, in relationship to, for instance, the redevelopment of uh, uh, Paris under Haussmann, the, the bankers uh, started to play a very critical role, setting up credit institutions, financial institutions, uh, to support uh, the circulation of, uh, uh, of fixed capital, but also to, to create a, a, a market for loan capital and a debt market as, as well. So what, what Marx is beginning to talk about here is the circumstances under which what appears to be a monolithic uh, process of, in, of the circulation of interest-bearing capital splits into uh, interest-bearing capital, profit of enterprise, and on that basis, interest-bearing capital uh, actually underpins the formation of a class of financiers. And the class of financiers start to have very explicit uh, impacts upon the dynamics of the circulation of capital. So this is, this is if you like, one of the... Sorry. This is, the, if you like, one of... One, uh, part of the argument that comes in right towards the end of the Grundrisse, where, uh, as I mentioned last time, you get this kind of uh, theoretical division going on. You, you start with use and exchange value and you just go on between relative and absolute surplus value. You keep on coming to these moments where you divide into two. Uh, he divided between fixed and circulating capital. Uh, in order to get the fixed capital, you need interest-bearing capital. And here he's saying, well, actually, interest-bearing capital presupposes uh, another division, which is a division between the financiers and the industrialists. The industrialists primarily concerned uh, with profit of enterprise and the financiers uh, concerned uh, with the, uh, the rate of return on, on loan capital uh, through, through debt financing. So this is Marx kind of going, and then, 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 then I, it, it, this poses the problem of what would the next step be? Uh, and in and, and, and this, and in what ways do finance and industry get together and create uh, some kind of new configuration. Uh, my own view, I think, is that at a certain point, uh, because of the, debt, the nature of debt financing and the speculative nature of uh, fixed capital formation and the speculation that's involved in debt financing, that at a certain point you're going to find a division within the financial uh, financialization, which is a different uh, distinction between fictitious and real capital. Marx in volume three talks about fictitious capital. 
uh, is speculative capital that has not yet been valorized and may never be valorized. It is something that can circulate even though it's not been valorized. So fictitious capital, capital uh, is going to come into the picture, I think. Uh, so if you kind of ask me what do I think the next step would have been in Marx's analysis had he got there, it would be to start to talk about the relationship between real capital and fixed capital and what that dynamic looks like and to what degree are we living in a world now of fictitious capital where fictitious capital is dominant uh, and uh, real capital is sort of uh, struggling to be, uh, to be created and to be heard. But if fictitious capital has no basis in real capital, that's going to lead us into financial crises and you could argue that what we saw in 2007 and 2008 was an example of fictitious capital uh, suddenly realizing that there was no base, uh, material base for its fictions and that therefore the fictions came unplugged and you got a crisis uh, in the financial system uh, around fixed capital and, and, and uh, 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 around fixed capital circulation and consumption fund formation. So these are a couple of issues that uh, were left over from last time which I'd want to uh, be very explicit about. Um, do you have any kind of comments about this finance capital, fictitious capital kind of stuff? Yeah. Hi. So if if like commenting on this or a question on, on that point. That being said, what you said, and also in, in uh, his writing on class struggle in France, uh, he, he Marx says, like he mentions the word or the term financial aristocracy. Okay, but in many cases around the world, we see uh, the opposite. Like we see uh, the financiers and the industrial capitalists really in in a very uh, with a very strong bond uh, together and i'm asking this question because sometimes uh i am going to take the the case of of lebanon uh people who are seeking change or so on and they want to build productive uh, economy and so they always rely on this industrial class as it, based on its contradiction with the financiers and the, the the financial capital there but never like we never see a positive outcome of this we never see a clear manifestation of this contradiction uh, uh, in the position of the industrial capitalist so my question would be can it be okay we have a scenario of a contradiction or a division between the two but can we also have a scenario where both converge to one form of i don't know oligarchy or so because also and here i can like is is a very brief anecdote uh one of the industrial capitalists in lebanon after the crisis he was on tv the most famous tv show and he was telling how he made a lot of profit out of the CDSs, the insurance on the sovereign debt, and he's a member of the parliament, and he used inside information. To, so he's the you know the number one industrial capitalist, but made a lot of profit from uh, that service and securities and insurance on that. So can they converge to one oligarchy? Not necessarily to see this division. Thank you. Well, they they, they certainly can, and and I you know. I'm speculating on what, what I'm, what's going on around, but here Marx is kind of saying that historically uh, the financiers, kind of uh, the, the bankers, if you like, uh, preceded the formation of industrial capital. So industrial capital was very much financed by uh, industrial, sorry, industrial capitalism was very much financed out of uh, uh, the banking capital and, and and when Marx kind of says so that actually what happens here is that uh, it's uh, the interest rate that drives the profit and, and creates the profit so that would historically be the case so in many countries I would kind of uh, imagine uh, 
that uh, that that will be typical of a of, of a situation in a, a in a, a lesser developed uh, country. In 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 terms of Manchester capitalism, it was the other way round, and 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 that became significant. But your point about them coming together is yes, both of them rest on surplus value. In other words, the surplus value is being divided between loan capital and, and industrial capital. But both of them, in the end of the day, are involved in the production of surplus value. And it is surplus value that gets di divided. Uh, so that means that, they're, that they're, uh, to a certain degree they, they are bound to be concordant with each other. Uh, and while there may be some rivalry between them, there will be no rivalry when it comes to the production of surplus value. So this is again Marx kind of saying that when, when you get to this point in the analysis, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing as to where he might go when I kind of go, well, the fictitious capital uh, side of things as opposed to the real capital side of things, the fictitious capital is typically represented by banks lending to banks. Uh, and and and, uh, the, 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 and and a lot of banking business right now is taken up with lending to other banks, so so that is circulation of fictitious capital on its own right. And then the question arises: is, uh, you know, and we, we're we're looking at that right now. We see a lot of banks which are which uh, have been actually looking very good because they've been lending to other banks, and then people are saying, well, what lies behind this? Uh, and one of the big questions in today's Financial Times was, well, if you think that commercial property uh, is adequate to lie, lie behind a lot of this right now, commercial property is in a lot of trouble and you're likely to see commercial property collapse. And, and with that, many of the small banks in the United States, which are heavily invested in commercial property, are likely to go under. So the fact that we've seen four or five banks go under right now, many people, you know, Biden and all the rest of it say, oh, this is just, you know, everything is perfectly sound, etc." But there's a lot of grumblings in the, in the financial press right now that, the, that the, the, the leases are due on commercial property over, over the next year and that we're likely to see many banks going under because uh, they cannot renew those leases at that level and, in fact, will find themselves holding empty property. And, and so we're likely to see something of that, of that, of that kind. So this is, this is where... where uh, um, uh, but uh, Marx, actually, when he's talking about the 18th century talks about the rise of a bankocracy, which is actually based on land. And actually the British landed aristocracy, a lot of them still maintained their landlord status and, and, and in the end were wiped out. But the British landed aristocracy used the land as collateral to go into banking. So the city of London and the big banking in the city of London was essentially occupied by landed aristocracy. Uh, which, is, which, is, which is, again, a class formation which arose out of a particular situation in the 18th century when landed, landed property was, was, was okay and they, could, they, they got... and they could use that as collateral to borrow and become involved in, in banking. So, and, and, and actually, the aristocratic uh, influence over the city of London continued up until about 1980 or so, and it was only after the quantitative, if you like, the quantitative revolution in banking, which is about computerized, you know, the City of London, you know, computer exchange and all those kinds of things, uh, has really changed the nature of banking. But up, and, up until uh, in the 1960s and, and so on, uh, Banking main the main banking houses in in London were came out of an aristocratic tradition, aristocratic heritage, uh, which was very quote gentlemanly. So this is where the you know the top hats and all those kinds of things and the class signatures were. That all break, was broken down and uh, well not totally broken down but was much 
much altered uh, from eighteen seven from nineteen seventy onwards. So yes, uh, the, the, how the class formation works, and whether the aristocracy, and oh, but another point which is interesting: the large corporations, uh, the car companies, for example, in the nineteen eighties, were faced with. Uh, a lot of heavy, uh, it was very, very competitive between the you know, Japanese firms, the South Korean firms, the US firms, the European firms. So global, global competition in the auto industry was very, very strong. But at that time, uh, you were getting a lot of um, uh, commodity chain stuff like Ford started to produce its engines in Brazil and uh, General Motors was doing it in Mexico, you know, so you start to find this sort of thing going on. And they were finding that they they needed to hedge uh, their purchase of raw materials and also their sales. So they started engaging in financial operations so that you would actually see a company like Volkswagen actually making a profit in the 1990s out of financial operations and not out of car production. Because, because and, and, and it's interesting that a lot of the uh, talent in the automobile industry in the 1980s came from the financial sector rather than the engineering sector. So, so actually, even, even within the, a company, you can find that they have two ways of making a profit. One is to play around with and the money markets and currency futures and hedging um, on raw material supplies and all kinds of things like that. They could make money out of that or they could make money out of making cars. And for a while in the 1990s, they were making more money out of financial operations than they were out of cars. So you'll find all kinds of dualities of this sort going on, which are really interesting to, uh, to, to, to follow up. And it seems to me that, again, one of the things I like about Marx's analysis here is it, it, it is open to those sorts of fluidities and those movements. So when he talks about, yeah, okay, you want to talk about the finance and you want to talk about the engineering side, uh, but at the same time you'll see that, that there are situations where... Uh, more is happening on this side than on that side, and then it flows back again. Yeah. Um, so my question is about the relationship between fictitious and real capital, and sort of in moments of crisis for fictitious capital, whether it relies on real capital to get it out of that crisis, like via bailout, bailout or whatnot, or if fictitious capital can grow like independent of real capital and sort of save itself because everything is so financialized. I guess how to think through that. I think the model here would be uh, to think back to fixed capital where Marx says uh, you cannot point to a particular capital and call it fixed capital without specifying its use. So that a given capital, if it changes its use, is no longer fixed capital. For instance, a cotton mill goes out of business. It's part of fixed capital of production. Uh, a developer comes along and redevelops it and turns it into something um, of condominiums or something of that kind. So the same building is fixed capital for a certain part of its history, then becomes part of the consumption fund for another part of its history. So its use becomes significant. The distinction between fixed, fisc uh, uh, fictitious and real capital is of that sort. Yeah, when you get a change of use, so you can move from the fictitious to the real. Let me give you, I think, um, a, a, an interesting example, and I, and I can't remember all, all, all of the details, but um, Argentina uh, was deeply in debt in the crisis of 2001, 2002, and had a financial crisis, 
um, a bit like Lebanon has had, where people could only draw three hundred dollars out of on, on their accounts and things like that. So Argentina had uh, a, a huge crisis. It couldn't pay its foreign foreign debt. So there was a big fight. You know, would the would the International Monetary Fund help them? Well, Argentina had kicked the IMF out, and so there was a problem. Um, but it was it was in default, and it had to try and get out of default. So one of the things it did was to kind of say, okay, we have all this debt, which is, you know, I've forgotten how many how much it was, but it was a huge debt. Um, we'll offer to pay it back at 30% of the debt. So instead of, a, you know, instead of $100, you get $30. Okay. That's what they offered to, to all the finance, financial people. And some of the financial people agreed so in a sense, what you had was the the uh, the erasure of fictitious capital. That is, two thirds of the capital was forgiven, uh, and 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 you know one third of it was paid out, and two thirds. So, so at that point, you, you know, Argentina had uh, sort of made real, made fictitious capital. Real, but only thirty cents on the dollar. Now, a lot of institutions looked at the situation and said they would never get their money back, given the way things were going in Argentina, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, so they just accepted that. But some uh, debtors did not. So there was a residual part of the debt from that period which had not, which was not settled. Uh, now, along came. Of uh, a, a vulture capitalist, let's call him. A uh, guy called Peter Singer, I think his name was. And what he did was to go around to all of those uh, people who had residual debt with Argentina and board up their debt. Again, he bought it up presumably at uh, you know, a certain certain price, maybe forty cents on the dollar or thirty cents on the dollar. I don't know, but he bought it up. So in the end, he was he, he accumulated a large amount of Argentinian debt, and he was he was uh, running one one of these vulture fund, funds, and he was saying he wanted he wanted back hundred percent. So he was going he was, he was saying to the Argentinians, "You've got to make this real by by giving me hundred percent." Of the of the value of all this debt I've accumulated, uh, Argentina refused, and, and 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 it all ended up up in a court. In with this sort of thing, all the contracts are in dollars, so the U.S. juridical system becomes involved. It all ended up in a court case uh, of this hedge fund versus Argentina, which went on for for years. Uh, and uh, of course, different administrations were going on, and you know the Kirchners were, were in power in Argentina, and they weren't going to settle the debt, etc., etc., etc. So, so, um, uh, so this court case went on and on and on, with a judge who knew nothing about finance whatsoever, but who disliked the Argentinian mode of presentation, which was uh, rather arrogant, and and he was saying all kinds of crazy things. So. So, so, the, so the point here is that the, there's a fight going on as to whether this this capital can be made real, and if so, how. And the Argentinians were saying it couldn't be made real. They could only, they know, they had, as far as they were concerned, they they'd settled it at thirty cents on the dollar, and they wanted to do that again. And and this this was this this was just a you know it was called a vulture fund because this is what it was doing. It was. It was it was picking up the morsels of debt and and, and 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 ingesting them and consolidating them and turning them into a kind of thing. So it went on it went on for a very considerable amount of uh, amount of time. 
And, and, uh, but eventually the regime changed in Argentina because during this whole period, Argentina could get no access to the international credit markets because, you know, nobody would lend them money because, you know, you would lose it uh, immediately. So, so, uh, so somebody, then Macri became president and, and he was of the centre-right or right-wing and, and he wanted to settle the, the, the whole kind of debt. So in the end, he, he said, OK, we'll make it all real. Uh, and uh, they, 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 I don't know whether they made it 100% real or whatever, but it was pretty much pretty high and 90% real. So Singer made out with a huge amount of profit out of this. And this had gone on since... This was only settled about three or four years ago, maybe more than that, four or five years ago. It was uh, finally settled and it had been going on since 2001. These court cases take a long time. But the, the, the point is, this is what I mean about what, what, what's fictitious and what's real. Uh, and, it's a, it, and it was made partially real by Macri. And so... Uh, at that point, uh, Argentina could go into a national credit market and borrow money and it could go to the IMF and, and do all these kinds of things. But there was an interest, very interesting moment, and I've forgotten exactly what the, what the, the, the issue was, in which um, Singer insisted that he be paid first that he, and he would get 100%. He insisted on 100%, as I remember, and, and, and the judge had... had, had Taken all the outstanding debt, about seventy or eighty percent of which was singers, but there was another twenty percent residual that people still had uh, on it, and and so sing uh, so so singer said he wanted to be paid first, and he wanted hundred percent, and the judge turned to him and said something like pretty rude to him and said, look, you've had your day, you've had your fun, uh, get out of here, or I'll I'll put you last in being payment. We'll pay off all of the other small debts uh, first. So Singer stopped at that point and then, then agreed to, to take the settlement, whatever it was. It wasn't, wasn't 100%. I'm sure it was maybe 90%. But Singer made out with a huge amount of money out of this. So this operation, this is, in this operation, you see, well, the question is, how, how, much, how much of this fictitious capital can be converted back into real? And, and, and that is the nature of any speculation. So all speculative capital, in a sense, is, is fictitious capital. And it is usually backed, however, uh, by a collateral, which can be land or property or something of that kind, uh, in, which, in which the lender has at least this, some security. But in the Argentinian case, people had, led, had, had, had lent to the country uh, and only got back 30% of what they lent in the first round and, and, and 70 or 80% of what they lent. So, so the, the point here would be to say, within the system as a whole right now, you have a vast amount of capital where you think there, it has a real basis, you think there is viable collateral there, but as it happened in 2008 when people started to kind of look at what was all, all of that money that was uh, in housing mortgages and which was supposed to be viable, it turned out they weren't. So again, the capital went from, uh, from real to f a fictitious status uh, almost ov overnight in 2007, 2008. And Lehman Brothers, which thought it had collateral and thought it was real, uh, it was found, and so they, they went bankrupt. It turned out, however, subsequently, when people did the analysis, was the, 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 the collateral that, that Lehman held in the terms of, uh, of, of mortgages was worth much more than uh, it had been valued at by the, uh, the Treasury Department and, and the Federal Reserve. 
And uh, so a lot of argument is now held that Lehman Brothers need not have gone bankrupt. But if they'd had a proper valuation of the assets there, which they didn't really have, uh, if they had a proper valuation of the assets that were backing uh, that, the, 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 it was being judged fictitious capital when in fact it was, it was, it was real. Uh, you, you know, bankruptcies and, 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 and some of the things that have been going on in the banking system just now and, uh, and I think that uh, if the Financial Times is, is, is right and there's likely to be a, a commercial property-based crisis in a, in a year or two, then, then again we'll, we'll be in a situation where something is supposed to be real but it turns out to be fictitious uh, because the market then, uh, then shifts. So, so that's, that's the way in which you have to, to, look, to look at it. And if you kind of say, well, how much is fictitious? Um, well, in 2007, 2000, but then when the property market recovered within three years, people kind of said, oh, no, well, the fictitious has disappeared. Uh, it, 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 it's real. After all, you've sold your, your commodity or good or, or realised your capital that you can say, well, actually, it was real. Up until that point, you don't know. Is it real? Will it be? Won't it be? So to the degree that capital is a speculative system, uh, you, you find yourself uh, having to recognise that a large chunk of capital circulating at any moment is fictitious. Normally it will be its fictitious qualities are confirmed. Any other kind of questions on this. So the rest of this, the rest of this week was, I was suggested you, I, I wrote a, a sort of bit of an essay at the end saying what, what I thought was uh, significant, important in uh, um, in the Grundrisse. And I wondered if you had any ideas that you wanted to share about what you think is important about what we've done and how, what, what, have you, what have you learned from this whole kind of exercise? Anybody want to have a crack at it? Let's just go around the room. I'll call on people then. <laughs> okay. Amon Roy. Um, bit on the spot. Um, I mean, I think as I was going over, uh, I was thinking about this last week, not so much today, but um, I think one of the questions that I'm left with at the end of this course is something that I want to think about in relation to, um, let's say, the relationship between fictitious and real capital. I'm just going to state a question and not summarize any, um, yeah. But that question has been sort of the mediating role of the state in certain conversations around um, managing the fictitious character of capital, especially in terms of, uh, so I look at smart cities, specifically the speculative character of how these cities are branded and how a certain um, value is assigned to their aesthetic valorization in relation to the nation state and how speculative capital sort of constructs uh, narratives around that. And that translates to something that becomes fictitious capital without any relationship to the real um, and yeah, that's a question I have, and I don't understand that relation very well. So I'd like to think about that more. And so the Grundrisse is obviously a very good foundation block to think about that relationship in terms of a totality across scales. Um, yeah, that's. Anybody else, anybody else want, want to follow up? I think 
Sorry, what's your name? Sorry, Brendan O'Connor. Oh, Brendan. Um, I won't be doing this right away, but uh, I'm looking forward to going back and rereading the introduction, which I struggled with. <laughs> but now, having gone through the rest of the text and very closely watched the um, the unfolding of the method that he lays out in the introduction. Maybe I'll <laughs> have a better <laughs> have a better grasp going back and rereading the introduction. Partic I particularly struggled with the idea of the um, ascending from the abstract to the concrete. I think that I I think that that idea is a little bit more concrete <laughs> itself to me now. Um, but I am still struggling to uh, appropriate it and apply it for my like in my own in my own work, which is what I'm where I'm trying to get to. But I think I feel a little bit closer <laughs> than I was at the start of the course, for sure. Um, but yeah, the ascent from the abstract to the concrete is a little bit clearer now. I think. How how is it clearer? I mean, then what? Can you give me an example, a concrete example of the... A concrete, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, David, this is, is this my oral exam right now? <laughs> no, no, I'm, no, I'm, I mean, I'm, I think, I'm, I think, I think the, ex exactly what we were just talking about. I mean, this abstraction, like that, <clears throat> that fictitious and and. Um, Or that finance and pro and productive capital that these are actually that these are kinds of abstractions from, as I understand it, kind of from surplus. That that this pro this dialectical process of kind of dividing and, and dividing and identifying the ways that these things can be um, bifurcated within themselves behind the apparent superficial reality. Uh, that those abstractions actually get us closer to concretely what is what is actually going on and, and what is moving beneath the surface. Um, even though, you know, what is concrete ultimately is the concrete <laughs> um, that these things get invested in. Yeah. Um, but the constant cycling through one form into another, that's the other thing that has really resonated is, is the... Um, the processual nature of everything that we're talking about and that the um, even when things are fixed there's this kind of urgent animus <laughs> to change um, I'm still thinking about how to tie these things together but that's where I'm left you know one of the things that uh, I do when I'm teaching capital, but it does, and it does arise in the Grundrisse too, is that whenever Marx uses the word appears, you, you have to recognize he's saying it appears that way, but there's something else going on here. Um, the obvious example was it, it, it appears as if the sun goes around the earth. You know, but you know it. <laughs> You know, science teaches us that that isn't the case. And Marx has a very interesting kind of comment. He says, if, if everything was as it appeared to be on the surface, then there would be no need for science. And that the real science is to find out what lies behind the appearance. And in Capital, and you see elements of that in Grundrisse, he often... Um, uh, alludes to the idea of fetishism, which is a mask. What is it that masks the origin of profit? And how expert, you know, contemporary economics is at, at, at masking the origins of profit in terms of the exploitation of labor power and production. So, and surplus value, you can't see it. But it helps you with the concept and the immateriality of the relations are, are actually helpful in 
understanding what, what's going on. So when he's talking about getting from the, uh, rising from the abstract to the, the concrete, he has a dual motion. You know, you start with the concrete and you try to find out what's the abstraction behind it. And once you know the abstraction behind it, you bring it back to the surface and say, well, this explains why this happens concretely. And that's, that, that's what, he's, what he's striving for. Uh, and and um, this, this, therefore, requires uh, a scepticism towards the world of appearance. Uh, and uh, if you seek to extend Marx in some way, as I was suggesting might want to in terms of fictitious and real, but you'd also do this in, in terms of the state. Um, in my own work, for example, I've been writing about what I call the state finance nexus, which is the, there's an appearance as if uh, the state controls things, but when you look at it and you go back and you look at what happened 2007, 2008, it was the state in the form of the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve. Now, the Federal Reserve, I don't know if you think of it as a state institution or do you think of it as a, as a, a banking institution? Actually, technically, the Federal Reserve is independent of the state and it is the pinnacle of the banking system, the financial system. The Treasury is the state part. And if you look, if you look at the, the same thing happens in the, with respect to the judiciary. The, the, you know, the, the judiciary of the United States has its pinnacle in the Supreme Court. Its state apparatus is the Attorney General in the Justice Department. So you find you find out actually a duality, and you find you know there's the Treasury Department which is issuing debt and doing all kinds of things like that, and it's the Federal Reserve which is gov gov dealing with monetary policy. The Treasury Department tends to be more biased towards fiscal policies, taxation, and all the rest of it. Whereas, so so those two institutions are separate from each other. They sometimes fight with each other. But when the shit hit the fan in 2007, 2008, and everybody went to ground, nobody knew what to do, the two people who came out to do it were Ben Bernanke of the Federal Reserve, Hank Paulson of the Treasury, and Tim Geithner because that's the part of the Federal Reserve that has due, has the jurisdiction over Wall Street. So you've got, you've got there what I would call a, a state finance nexus. It's not the whole of the state, it's just the Treasury Department. And part of the problem when you kind of say the state is you've got to disaggregate the state into that part of the state which is actually deeply, deeply embedded in the circulation of capital and is part of the circulation of capital. And that's the Treasury Department. It's not the Education Department. It's not the, you know, or any of that. So, so, so we, get, we get a problem because, again, if you look at it concretely, you would end up with this abstraction of saying, actually, the, the central nervous system of a capitalist structure is given by this state finance nexus. They're the ones who when, when problems come, have, have to get together and have to work things out. Now, they're supposed to be independent of each other. That is, the, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be independent of the executive branch, supposedly. And, and, and it's a fiction, but at the same time, it's also real. So you would, you would conduct an analysis 
of what is going on by looking at this relationship within the within the state finance nexus, and and it has a, the state finance nexus has a long history. Uh, it, it it came back. It goes back to the formation of the Bank of England in 1694, and that in itself was very interesting because. The monarchy at that time had engaged in wars and was broke. It needed to borrow money. So it went to the merchants of the city of London and said, uh, OK, lend us money, we, we need... And the merchant said, get lost. We're not lending you money, you'll just fritter it away, doing, doing whatever. So the compromise they came to was that the state would charter, would set up a charter for the Bank of England which would be independent and which would have shares that would be dominated by the big merchants. So the big merchants all took shares in the Bank of England and they could then lend money to the state but at the same time had, had some sort of way of saying, of finding out what the state was doing and limiting what the state did. So at that point you suddenly find the, the, the state finance nexus works. Uh, if you want another example of that, it worked, it worked beautifully in Britain recently. I don't know if you remember a prime minister who was a prime minister for 10 days. Liz Truss. She, she came in and she had a program. It was an austerity program. She was going to do this and that and do that and do this. And the bondholders went, uh-oh. <laughs> and she was thrown out of power and immediately you got different politics coming in immediately. So the state finance nexus is kind of really, is, re is really important to ana analyze in, in detail. And, and, and you know, some countries have a very sophisticated version of it, but almost all countries have a treasury department and almost all countries have something akin to a central bank. And the relations between those two form this... Uh, regulatory apparatus. It's a regulatory apparatus of a, of a, of a capitalist system and, and it works politically as well as economically. So that also, I think, says, well, okay, once you, once you approach a situation uh, such as we have right now, and you have, you're equipped with the notion of, okay, what's the state finance nexus going to do? And you kind of say, well, it's, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're back to certain policies which are coming out of the Federal Reserve. And you've got Yellen uh, in this Treasury Secretary who was uh, chair of the Federal Reserve before. So, that, you know, this is, these are the key institutions to watch. And those are the key institutions which you don't find, you know, the serious, the serious literature uh, uh, or the serious commentary in the, in the press. Uh, in, the, in, in, for instance, the Financial Times and so on is watching very carefully what, those, what these people do and, and, and the positions they take. Uh, and uh, what they will allow and won't allow. Uh, it's interesting that uh, one of the ways in which you can deflate the debt is by inflation. And it's, in it's interesting, people say we've got to control inflation, and yes, they want to they're bringing it down, but on the other hand, right now, inflation is a very good tool for deflating the debt. And, and to the degree that the debt is fictitious capital up the wazoo and maybe a lot of it needs to be deflated somehow, it could be that there's a little manipulation of this, uh, this, uh, of this inflation rate because it redistributes uh, money to, to the debtors in effect. 
So who else has a... Let me call on somebody. Anna Schlenz? Yes. Yeah. Oh, somebody there, okay. You go next. Hi, David. Thank you uh, so much. Um, I'm... Um, my name is Moa. I'm a student in the anthropology program. Sorry, I can't hear you. My name is Moa. I'm a student in the anthropology program. And uh, I think for me, um, this being the first time uh, I've been uh, in doing a close reading of Marx, uh, my first experience of um, being in a class like this, uh, something that I found really interesting was his engagement with uh, bourgeois political economy and taking taking the concepts um, and sort of deconstructing them using his uh, dialectical method. I thought um, it was interesting, um, like going back to the anecdote that he starts off the text with of Robinson Crusoe going onto the island and then sort of we imagine that he's just inventing these things, but actually he's carrying his own sort of cultural um, concepts and um, ideas of the world when he uh, when he lands up there. And I think that the um, the simultaneous sort of um, circulation of capital, but also the ideas that come along with capital. And um, again, going back to the this notion of the like the abstractions, and it really like complicates a lot of the a um, lot of our assumptions, even of nature. I thought, and um, yeah. Which abstractions were you most interested in? Well, uh, one thing that I was curious about, and I think that people have asked is, like, how do we understand nature as our land um, under capitalism? It's because it relies on a certain... Um, we rely on a certain like assumption of nature as something that is in the background upon which um, upon which processes of production um, like don't see we don't seem to think of them as dependent anymore on nature but rather as um, just I think there's a discussion of how it's just there from which nature is just there, this thing that from which we can constantly ex extract. Um, but also that we are producing notions of what nature is through these, um, through these processes of extraction. Um, and I'm interested in um, how disasters and especially uh, in the context of climate change, form ruptures in this, uh, in a sort of the dominant notions of what nature is, and even time, I think. Um, and so I'm also interested in how the global and local processes, or even notions of time, sort of collide in these moments. Um, yeah. What, what do you make of the metabolic uh, nature of the nature? <laughs> I think that the the diagram that you had brought up in initially was of the entire the process of capital, like as a this circular form, but also like it, as a spiral. Um, I mean, I don't know if that relates to the metabolic um, 
process well, capital, of nature. Capital draws right. off this, extracts from it, as you were saying. Uh, there's an extractivism going on, and, uh, and, and clearly uh, the whole process that's going on there needs to be fueled, and, you know, and so oil is going into it, and so you can imagine that diagram and imagine all the flows that are coming in as what Marx calls the free gifts of nature. Uh, and that they're, uh, <clears throat> I mean, they're free, not because they should be or anything of that kind, but they're free because capital doesn't want to pay for them. So, of course, a lot of uh, public policy and politics is now trying to make capital pay for the environmental consequences of its actions. And that's very hard to do because, you know, capitalists don't like doing that. So they immediately hire lobbyists and, and, and make sure that um, political power doesn't, you know, force them to pay too much. But, but clearly uh, the, what, what we call externalities in the field of uh, economic behavior are, are such that capital thrives on, on, on zero cost or very low cost supply of services from, from the, the natural processes. Um, and, and as a result of that, you've got degradation of those, the qualities of that in terms of global warming and habitat extinction and all the rest of it. I mean, there's a long history of pursuing that line of thought. Um, I think I'm in the same boat in that this was my first time actually like wrestling with Marx and reading him closely. Um, and I am a geography student and I study the far right and like 21st century fascism. So I think it was super helpful for me to like, you know, methodically go through the different moments in the totality and then to find those possibilities for crisis and then to for myself be able to identify those crises as possible moments for the development of like the fascist tendency within the working class. Um, and I think, especially in the conclusion of this commentary, we talk a lot about how Marx has this like refrain of the like liberated man and this like socialist future. Um, and so now I'm just kind of thinking about like is that a guarantee? I don't think so. I, don't, I think we all know that's not a guarantee. Um, but there are like two sides of this anti-capitalist feature. Um, one is this like liberatory one that we all want. And then one could also be m more fascistic. Um, and that's, that's where I am now at the end of this course. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I introduced that idea about the emancipated laborer. I'm still trying to think about that. What it might mean? Do I mean that uh, you know they've all read Marx and therefore understood <laughs> the principles of totality, or do you know what what does it mean? I mean, but if you're interested in that, well, what, what, what would you propose to look at? What do you think would be most important? I don't think I understand what you mean. Well, if. I ended up there sort of vaguely referring to what might be called the, um, the, the training program, if you like, for the emancipated laborer. Um, and and what, would that look, what would that look like? What, what kinds of... I'm, I'm, I'm sort of interested in, in, in that. And if you're working on the right, you know, presumably you have also have some ideas about what we might work on the left, I don't know. Not, not yet, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only in my first year, just getting started. But I, yeah, no, I don't know. I think 
I think that there's like this, I don't know, and in, in from what I've read in the conversations that I have, I feel like we think of the socialist alternative or like the, the socialist future as the obvious one in the face of capitalism. Or like if we're not anti-capitalist or if we're not capitalist, we're obviously for this like leftist future. Um, and I don't think that that future is as guaranteed as we all like talk about and think about. I think like, yeah, the, the fascist threat is a, is a real threat. Um, Brendan and I are in a class on Gramsci this semester. So thinking a lot about Italy and thinking a lot about the failure of the left um, and the failure of the left as the opportunity for the fascist party. Um, it's just kind of what has been in the background of reading the Gundrisa, like all of the evidence that shows us that there is no like real hopeful futurity for capitalism doesn't necessarily guarantee for us that like a, a leftist future will come without any real uh, threat or obstacle. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it's not. It's not automatically automatic, obviously. But um, uh, I guess I, I'm just a bit interested in the question of the, the kind of pedagogy of the emancipated laborer. What would that look like? Um, and there have been historical periods, um, for instance, in uh, the, the, the British left in the 1930s, 1940s, um, there was, a, there was a, a movement which was supported by the government towards adult education, a uh, recognition, recognition that uh, level, levels of... Uh, understanding and so on were not really adequate to the transformations that were occurring in uh, capitalist society in terms of uh, skills and understandings and all the rest of it. So, and, and what, was, what was interesting was that a lot of uh, the famous figures on the British left at that time, uh, Raymond Williams, E.P. Thompson and so on, all of them couldn't get jobs in the universities, but they could in adult education. So all of them were into adult education and they were very much uh, about a, a kind of a mobilising a grassroots educational system for a population in such a way as to politicise it in certain ways without kind of going, hey, you've got to be a socialist or you're thrown out, you know. I mean, and, and, and that had a, a, a very huge impact on the qualities of British Marxist thinking. I mean, if you if you take somebody like uh, uh, Raymond Williams, for example, um, I mean, maybe you have or haven't read it. I don't know. But uh, the, the the point is that uh, the the the, nat the nature of of left Marxist thinking in Britain was radically different from that in in France. French was very much more intellectualized and, uh, and, and theoretical and abstract and more philosophically based in, in a way. Whereas, whereas in Britain it had this strong uh, uh, presence in, uh, for instance, E.P. Thompson's uh, fabulous book on the making of the English working classes was talking about the whole class history that existed from the 18th century onwards and uh, all, all of the radical currents that existed and got pulled together and all the rest of it. So, so, so the point, point is that if you were in France, the, your pedagogy would be a very, very different kind of thing than if you were in Britain. Um, I would I would have come out of the British tradition if uh, if I had uh, uh, thought about reading Marx at all before I I I, I left Britain, <laughs> and so I only started reading Marx when I was thirty five years old. And I had, did other things, but this is so. When you think about the pedagogy, you kind of say, well, you know, 
Well, what would we try to teach? Uh, would we start off about the totality and moments and the totality and all that kind of stuff? Or is that you know, so abstract and so, you know, just make no sense to, as, a, as a popular basis? At the same, but at the same time, a pedagogy is of that sort should be presumably robust enough to actually, this goes back to, you know, what's in the basement and what, what's, what's on top. Uh, that uh, if 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 you if if you commanded Marx's theory and the Grundrisse, for example, what what you know, what kind of uh, educational strategy would you have to try to enlighten people as to what is going on, and how would you use that? in concrete uh, situations. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a crisis of affordable housing. Pretty much everywhere in the world, but in New York City there's a crisis of affordable housing. There are about 60,000 people who are homeless in the city, in the metropolitan area. Uh, what's the answer? Uh, so you have a mayor and a uh, governor, both of whom have said, oh, they're committed to doing something about affordable housing. Well, what do they do? They simply argue that the crisis of affordable housing arises because we haven't built enough housing. It's a question of supply and demand. It's not a question of supply and demand at all. It is very much a question of affordability and what, and what kind of uh, and what kind of housing you can provide for a population that is learn earning less than $40,000 a year. But no, they think in terms of supply and demand. And, you know, and the only answer is uh, go to the developers and ask them to build more housing. Well, as you see around the city, there's plenty of housing being built. Trouble is it's the wrong sort, the wrong places. And then they are, so they use, they use a trickle down. Well, yes, we're, we're mainly building housing for the middle and upper classes. But, you know, if you build enough housing for them, then they'll move out of the housing they're in and that'll, you know, trickle down. It's nonsense. So the point, the point here would be that you would, you would want to educate somebody to could be very sceptical about people who use supply and demand arguments in this way. And the more people who kind of uh, uh, understand that, the, the more you're likely to get closer to doing some, really doing something about affordable housing. I mean, I've been working on housing ever since I came to this country in 1969. And exactly the same problems now as there were in 1969, and nobody is prepared to recognise that the fact that people have less than forty thousand dollars a year means that affordable housing through the market is impossible. It's impossible. So of course you, of course, the continuation of capitalist housing provision is 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 destined in itself, by definition, to produce unaffordability for the mass of the population. Which is something which I'm sure all of you are encountering in some way. Right? So the, so the, point, the point here would be that, that you would need a, a, a pedagogic strategies to Pursue questions of that sort, and 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 uh, alert public uh, understandings so that when people come along and say, "Oh, we've simply got to build more housing," and so we're talking to the developers about doing it, and yeah, they're doing it for high-income populations, but twenty percent of the housing is going to be affordable. And you say, "What is affordable?" Well, affordable is, uh, yeah, um, uh, less than eighty thousand dollars a year. And you say what? If affordable housing is being built 
than given to people who have eighty thousand dollars a year. You know, missing out fifty percent of the population. So then the question arises: All right, how do you organise production of the right kind of housing? All right, can we set up community land trusts? Can we do you know all kinds of things like that? Are different all sorts of different uh, legal systems. Can we redirect resources so that we don't, all that stuff you see being built over in Queens and on the river and so on, which is trying to do a sort of copycat of Shanghai. But then there's the issue of, well, what is, what is, what is the grid risk got to do with all of that? <laughs> Can you deal with that all just on its own? Or do you, did something come out of the grunnery so that tells you, that helps you understand something like that? Hi, um, my name is Khadija. Um, I don't have like any like strong academic background or anything. I'm, I'm a part of the New York YCL. And um, I mean, from what I took from it is just um, like I studied Marx, you know, here and there. And I'm like more interested in like philosophy. And um, for me, the, the when you talk about the totality and the system, it just it all just crumbles, like none of it seems to hold up any sort of reality. Um, that's what I took from it. And the only thing that's kind of keeping it semi, that's giving some sort of semblance of a reality is um, people who work, the workers. And um, even that, I was hearing you, I forget, maybe like two weeks ago saying that, you know, um, when we talk about labor and the surplus value and, you know, how it is now, certain things about it is breaking, breaking down. So for me, I'm just like the entire system um, is of itself like um, fictitious and um, just built on a lot of abstractions and and just like some of you know my own study in learning the way Marx uses language, um, like you said, to not really take, he has many different meanings for different words and um, a lot of like internal relations and, and different things. So one of the things that I'm interested in is just like from the standpoint of black subjectivity and um, you know, being brought into this country as commodities. Um, what what is what is um, what is work? What what does that mean um, for us? And just kind of viewing how how that affects you know black people ontologically to exist inside of these abstractions. Um, yeah, that's kind of like what I like study and do and stuff. Well, I think Marx is very, uh, very much aware that um, we're dominated to some degree by abstractions. And I think what he's interested in doing is trying to talk about the roots of those abstractions, where do those abstractions come from. And, and of course, it's very, it's very difficult to go to war against an abstraction. It's very difficult to have a, a political program which is antagonistic to abstractions. But there are abstractions which are, are ruling, and I think what Marx is concerned with is, well, how do they rule? So when, when, when I mentioned the case of... Uh, a British Prime Minister who tried to go against the abstractions and immediately loses her job, um, you see so straight away how some of the abstractions are real in their, in their, their concrete results. 
And uh, this is uh, one of the things that needs to be, uh, to be understood as to how these abstractions come about and, and what would be required uh, to change them. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mentioned the case of housing, but this is also uh, similarly uh, the way in which uh, housing, for example, gets segregated, how communities get segregated, how that happens. And, uh, and again, when, when Marx talks about the spatiality of uh, development and, and uneven geographical development of possibilities. Uh, there are a variety of ways in which uh, you can start to pin together some of these issues into a political, I think, into a, pol into a political position and, if possible, into a po political movement, into a political uh, transformation. Um, but again, at that point, you need to realize you, 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 you can't proceed in the absence of any knowledge of the, of the, of the abstractions, because the abstractions will come back and bite you unless you really figure out what they might be, how they might actually get positioned. And, and you know, Marx doesn't have all of the answers to any of these things, but, uh, but the, the thing I get out of it most of all is a mode of thinking and a mode of interrogation of, uh, of things going on around, uh, which reveals certain things that otherwise, as abstractions, get lost. So I, I, I'm very you know, interested in that, in, in, that, in that side of things. But what it, what it again, the theory of political subjectivity that Marx works with is that political subjectivity is not given by studying philosophy and it's not given by, you know, some revelation. For Marx, uh, it's very much given uh, by practices and therefore you, you, you turn to practices uh, as explaining to some degree uh, the beliefs that people have, that, that people cultivate their, their beliefs out of their practices rather than sort of uh, practices being preached from somewhere. I mean, that's Marx's view. I mean, it's not that preaching doesn't happen happens in the classroom, happens in the church, happens everywhere. Uh, but the, why, why that preaching might land concretely in terms of politics depends very much on the concordance of what is being taught and the practices which are around. And Marx kind of says, let's look at the practices, which is what historical materialism is about, looking at the practices, remembering the practices and taking the implications of the practices. Now, he tries to do that, doesn't succeed in many areas, and there's plenty of work to be done along those lines. But I think the point here would be that the, the process that Marx sets in motion is, is leading to certain understandings and, and leads, leads to certain revelations and so it's, a, so it's again, it's not only about studying practices, it's also about instituting practices in some way. So who hasn't talked? Who haven't talked yet? There's someone. Did you raise your hand? I didn't raise my hand, but I can talk off. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> about 20 minutes or so, so we could bring it back up. So do you want to go first on that one, then I'll pass it over. Um, okay. Uh, so I, my background is in sort of labor and labor research unions, et cetera. And 
reading the Gurindrasa and thinking about the totality has been really helpful for me because I think in the past, my research has focused on profit margins, what is like the real part of capital um, and those like money figures. But then reading about, you know, the annihilation of speed through time. And so thinking about, well, whose time is speeding up you know, someone's profit gain and that's like worker time and that's work intensity or rates versus massive wealth. Like maybe you think a large hospital's profit margins are decreasing over time, but maybe they're acquiring like seven other hospitals, you know, things like that where um, there's like really concrete things that I've encountered in my work that kind of go beyond the scope of just like number the profit numbers specifically and i don't know like moving forward i feel like there's this tendency in u.s labor to be protect like want to protect good american jobs and like this heavy domestic focus that i and i'm more interested in sort of solidarity across supply chains transnationally etc and i think that requires workers to see themselves like within the totality and not just their like protecting their little piece of the pie. And so I think reading the Grundrisse has been really illuminating for me around those, those sorts of issues and makes me want to, um, yeah, just participate in worker education that's more comprehensive. Yeah, um, similarly, I think um, I've sort of read Capital Volume 1, a little bit of 2, a little bit of 3, um, and what I like about the Gunrisa is that it seems to have elements of all three or aspects of all three and is more interested in the totality, particularly the circulatory process. And so I feel like it gives you a different kind of bird's eye view um, than the different volumes of capital. I really appreciated that. I feel like I understand the totality of, of Marxist system and capital um, better through reading um, the Gunri, so um, I also, I'm a philosopher, so I like um, a lot of the philosophical aspects um, in particular. And I, I think that in the Gunri, so you have a lot of moments which I think clearly um, indicate that for Marx, it's never really a case that any phenomenon that he's identifying or analysing is just simply good or simply bad, that it has this double-edged quality. I think that's clearer in the Gunrisa because he goes off on little <laughs> philosophical flourishes, which he doesn't do so much in Capital. Uh, and I guess if I was to choose an example of one that I found particularly enlightening, um, is this sort of question of the real abstraction of labour. Um, a lot of work that's done today in, in Marxian Marxology, I guess you'd say, is um, sort of on real abstraction and it tends to be talked about in a, in a negative light because of this idea of the domination by abstractions, etc. But I think in, in the Grunerisa there's a part where he makes it really clear that, again, this is a double-edged phenomenon in the sense that uh, it's socialising. It has this socialization of labour such that labour becomes sort of just labour in general. So in the new society, you know, necessary labour would just sort of, sort of wouldn't, wouldn't be bound up with your identity, right? You just sort of do it as something that needs to be done and then get on with doing your, um, your creative, you know, um, self-realisation outside of that. So that's just an example of, of that kind of phenomenon. Mm. And I love at the end how you talk about of your book because I think with Marx and with with capital etc. Sometimes it does look like it's just sort of economics. And Marx always said that this was meant to be the Bible of the working class. This is a proletarian revol you know uh, proletarian like the theoretical expression of the proletariat practical revolution. And sometimes you sort of read capital at the cow on earth. Is, is that the case here? And I think pointing out the way in which workers can gain a consciousness of themselves 
in relation to the different aspects of the circulatory process and the totality. Um, you can see how that's a really important part of consciousness uh, raising. Uh, yeah. So there's some, there's many more things, but that's a well, summary give, of the main things. <laughs> of other things, more yeah. things. You want me to talk more about things that I like? Gosh, I don't know. I love the part we <laughs> keep talking about. The parts like I love the part where he's talking, um, where he shits on Smith about labor and freedom, um, because he makes it really clear that um, uh, discipline, this idea of freedom as just a kind of like, you know, getting home from work and watching Netflix or something, is the kind of idea of freedom that we have as exhausted workers within capitalism. Um, but um, freed labour would not be a labour that doesn't involve a kind of discipline um, and that sort of great creative works where you can sort of realise yourself is going to involve sacrifice. And um, I, I, like, uh, I quite like that, uh, that moment in the book as well. Yeah, that's his uh, argument with uh, Fourier, uh, who held uh, you know, that all work should be play mm. and everything should be fun. And <laughs> Marx kind of says, no, it's hard work a lot of the yeah. time. He's a bit of a Protestant ethic feeding through there. But, but uh, no, yeah, I think you're, you know, you're right, this... Uh, this this idea that, uh, you know, it can be purely uh, play and revelatory and mm -hmm. you don't have to concentrate and work on anything. Uh, actually, he's kind of saying the rewards come from applying in a concentrated way. Which, and in that sense, he's uh, fighting. He's fighting Fourier throughout, uh, along with Proudhon and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, who hasn't uh, said anything? Who wants to say something? We have them. We'll here then. Hi, thanks for the class. Um, I've I've enjoyed it a lot, and I think for me the the theme that's resonated the most has been Marx's method of looking for countervailing tendencies, and the way that you explore that has really struck me as contrasting with a lot of other people's exploration of Marx, uh, where, you know, you see something like the falling rate of profit cited as a way to explain uh, relatively linear and to certain authors predictable historical development rather than being like countervailed by the growing mass as, as we were just reading and what you wrote. Um, but then seeing that and like, you know, all, all kinds of the contradictions that you're mapping out of like, more labor power, less necessary labor time, or, um, you know, increasingly social labor at the same time as being more and more objectively alienated. Um, so yeah, I, that, I found that very helpful. And, and even in some areas that I never even like imagined a countervailing tendency would come up with like the labor theory of value, but then that ultimately being something we want to see crumble, uh, rather than like the moral grounds for struggle against capitalism alone. Um, yeah. Um, thank you. My name is Natalia, and thank you very much for this course. Thank you for the People's Forum as well for opening up for non grad students uh, to be here. Um, I keep thinking from what you both said uh, in terms of labor and and how the, so of course, relating to the present, I can't help but doing that on how the uberization of the economy has, you know, labor, uh, a mass of laborers are now working through apps with totally disenfranchised and totally outside of the norms and to the extreme of neoliberalism, super harnessed by the extreme right, I think. I wonder what Marx would think about this mass of workers uh, 
at this point in in how the the extreme right is also trying to get people more into this idea of intra, being an entrepreneur if you were like solo worker and how this would relate to this to the fixed versus, versus circulating capital i think i don't i didn't quite make that relation if we would translate it to the present um yeah you have to be a little bit careful in imagining that um you know the whole world has changed dramatically since marx wrote um if you go to a uh, a dickens novel for example and you look at the characters in a Dif dickens novel you know there's porters there's people carrying your bags there's i mean in other, in other words uh, there was an equivalent of Uber, Uber uh, in, in society at that time. People and 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 in fact, uh, Marx in Capital puts out some interesting census data, in which by far the largest uh, group within what you might call the working class is, is in domestic employment. And and uh, and 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 there far is far more there than there are in industrial labor. So Marx is kind of uh, arguing about uh, and, and is depicting the conditions of a of a, 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 seg a segment of British society at that time. Uh, and it is a minority segment. It's not. It's not everybody around. If you if you took agriculture, which was huge, if you took kind of the personal services and so on, which was huge, then you have the, you know the cotton spinners and the steel workers and all that kind of thing. They're they're they're, they're not. So so uh, he's he's abstracting from a lot of that by kind of saying, look, the real dynamism of the economy is coming from this smaller sector. And that's where the key social relations rely, reside. It's that sector which is going to be the one which is going to be developing the new technologies. And, and, and the whole dynamism of, of the capitalist mode of production rests on what is happening in that sector, not in agricultural labour, not in service sector, not in domestic employment, and so on. So Marx is abstracting to some degree from the social conditions that then, then, then prevailed. And, you know, people then kind of say, well, you know, we've gone off industrial labor and we're now in the service sector. And I'm kind of going, well, it was a big service sector back then. Uh, if you look at the number of shopkeepers and, 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 and so on, uh, a lot of it has since been rationalized into large department stores and things of that kind, whereas these were small vendors all over the place. Um, so, so um, you know, Marx, I think, would, would, would say that, that uh, he's, not, he's not trying to analyze everything that's going on in society and, and that he's, he's, try, he's trying to understand the capitalist mode of production and what the what the dynamics of a capitalist mode of production are because that's where the that that that's where the action is that's where the uh, what determines how society evolves so when he writes in the in the grundrisse i think it's very interesting is that, that innovation becomes a business um He's he's right. He's he's writing about something which, uh, unfortunately, he didn't uh, expand on it. But if you if you look and, and uh, at electronics or something like that, you 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 see that uh, uh, nobody's content with the state of contemporary technologies. We're constantly looking to well, but who's doing that and why? Uh, and that sector is ploughing ahead and doing its thing, and we're all sort of hanging on to its coattails, more or less. 
speaking personally, I don't kind of uh, like all the, a lot of this innovation. <laughs> But it's but it's but it's going very fast and it's going very fast with AI going very fast. Well, who's pushing it very fast? So so his he's he's recognizing that even back then there were key sectors. And when he says innovation becomes a business, he doesn't talk about the organization of that. But when you look at it right now, you could write a PhD dissertation very easily, I think, about you know those sectors in which innovation has become a business and how they proceed, how they, how they build new products and how, you know, and you look at something like, uh, you know, the computer and, the, and a lot, of course, a lot of um, pharmaceutical products and things of that kind. Um, my God, you watch a television right now and you find you have about 50 different medical conditions that require at least 100 pills uh, to to keep them uh, keep you know keep you alive you know it's kind of <laughs> an, aston an astonishing picture and then you kind of say how did that come about well it didn't come about by way of the equivalent of the the Uber or the the porters and all the rest of it it came out about because of these key class sectors. And I think what's interesting about, about Grundrisse is his recognition that innovation becomes a business, a financial class starts to exert itself as an independent class with certain power vis-a-vis -vis industrial capital and all those sorts of things. So you're, you're getting a sketch of what the dynamic sectors are, not a, not a, not a complete accounting of what is going on within the... The, the social formation. And I think it's important always to recognise that that is what he's doing. Because otherwise you kind of get up, oh, well, he didn't, he didn't talk about domestic work. Well, no, he didn't. Uh, but that is for a certain reason, rather than a, uh, a, uh, uh, a, a, mere, a mere oversight. I mean, he, he's targeted. He says, I want to understand the dynamics of a capitalist mode of production. That's what I want to do because that's the core of what goes on in a capitalist society. And I'm going to isolate that and look at it and put it under the microscope as far as I can. And the only way you can put it under the microscope, given the, the nature of the problem, is through uh, the powers of conceptual abstraction. So his conceptual abstractions are designed to illuminate that particular process, which is the dynamics of capital accumulation and what the laws of motion are and, what, and how come people are, are, are caught uh, up in a world of abstractions which, uh, which, which dictates uh, the quality of daily life. Anybody else want to say anything? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm over here actually. Oh, okay. uh, Thank you so much for this class. I'm also uh, not a student, but I was fortunate enough to follow the class online. And um, after taking the class, I am really fascinated or interested in the idea of the emancipated uh, laborer, um, mainly because I, I come from a family of uh, generations of Detroit factory workers. And so um, uh, on that uh, idea, I can't help but be curious about, um, like you mentioned, AI, and uh, how that, you know, what that looks like moving forward and how AI, AI plays a, a, a right. role in, um, in capital. No, that's interesting. Yeah. And when, you, when you figure out what, all about the emancipated laborer, come and tell me. <laughs> I'm, I'm fascinated with the general idea and discussion. I think it's, it's very, very interesting. Uh, just kind of question, like, uh, um, because, for example, in Japan, like the Japanese prime minister, he proposed his policy guideline as a, what he called um, new capitalism. And uh, also in America, like, we see kind of uh, socialist awakening. Um, 
at least taking taking shape in this country um, and many other cases uh, worldwide. Do you think these are sufficient evidence to to somehow declare, okay, um, the end of neoliberalism, at least, if not capitalism, has come to, uh, has come, uh, yeah, it has come to an end, neoliberalism. Do, do you think that? Yeah, I, I tend to uh, disagree slightly with that. Um, but it depends very much on how you understand neoliberalism. As I understood, neoliberalism was a political project launched by the main corporations and the big elements within the capitalist class in the 1970s to ensure uh, their own increasing wealth and power. Uh, and they sought to do this by consent and through Reagan and Thatcher, they managed to do that to some degree. The consent began to disappear in the late 1990s, and I think it's now disappeared 2007, 2008. So the, the, the legitimacy of the neoliberal project has disappeared. The consent has disappeared. Uh, but the project is still intact, because if you start to look at, at, at the enormous increase in wealth and power of a small oligarchy, uh, it, is, it is going on fine. So as far as they're concerned, they're, they're, they're very happy. And as we see, they, they, they've managed to use all their wealth and power to corrupt Supreme Court, corrupt politics, corrupt everything. So yes, the neoliberal project was always about centralizing class power in an increasingly, a decreasingly small uh, group. And that is, I think, uh, alive and well. And they don't care about legitimacy anymore. They just go ahead and do what they're doing. And when anybody po protests immensely, they always kind of say, well, sick the police on them or something. So I, I, I think so I think the neoliberal project, which was about the consolidation of wealth and power within the, uh, the ultra uh, capitalist class, I think that's, that's still there. And, and it's, still, it's still the enemy. It's just that, uh, there's no consent and there's no legitimacy anymore. It's just raw political power that is being used, corruption and uh, um, and, and so on in terms of uh, how the system is working. But that's because my definition of neoliberalism was, was very much about concentration of wealth and power, that that's what it was about from the very beginning. And a lot of the thing about ideas and all that, and ethics and so on. Yeah, that's all uh, shut, shut down. So I think we're about ready to fold. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. And that's... And a huge thank you to you, David, for hosting and facilitating this class for the past, like, three or four months. Um, it was a great honor to hear all of your reflections today and just to see the, the progress throughout the class. So thank you for that. Okay. Good. Great.